My dad, like all dads, had a number of sayings he would repeat over and over and over again and again. One of them was, you play the way you practice, meaning, of course, that if you don't practice well or enough, when you come time to play a game, you're not going to play so well either. My dad was imbued with this play the way you practice because he was an athlete. He was a star athlete in high school football and high school swimming. He went to college on a football scholarship, which he left. He dropped out and joined the Marine Corps. While in the Marines, he became a boxer. When he got out of the Marine Corps, he got a degree and ended up being a high school teacher and football coach. Later on, he took up tennis and ended up being a college professor and a college swimming coach and college tennis coach. He was, you know, that coach guy. So it was always, you play the way you practice. And as much as I hated hearing it, it's really kind of true. You know, you think about it. If you're practicing something like tennis, you hit a backhand down the line over and over and over again so that in the middle of a point you don't think about it, you hit as good a backhand as you can. In baseball, you do drills over and over again. Ground ball, throw to get the force out. So in the middle of the game, when you get the ground ball, you know exactly where to throw the ball, right? Musicians and actors are the same. You practice and practice your instruments so that in the concert you perform well. Actors rehearse the play and the dialogue and the dance and the action over and over again so when it comes time for the performance, they hit it and do as best as they can. You do play the way you practice. The same is true of faith. We practice our faith so that when the time comes that we are called upon to really and truly live it out, sometimes under duress, we are able to do so. We practice our meditation, we practice our social justice, we practice our ethics. We imbue the faith in and through us so when the time comes and we are called upon to stand on those values, to take action upon those values, we have it in us to do so. The founder of our Unitarian Universalist Flower Communion, Reverend Norbert Chapek, practiced his faith to a master level, technique worthy of the highest professional. When he was called upon to walk his talk, he did not hesitate. He knew what he must do, what faith demanded of him, what his own foundational values required, no matter what the cost or the price he might have to pay. Reverend Chopek celebrated Flower Communion for the last time in June 1940 under the watchful eye of the Gestapo. Nazi Germany had invaded Czechoslovakia in March 1939, and Reverend Chopek had remained at his post, declining an offer from the American Unitarian Association president, Frederick May Elliott, for assistance in leaving the country and financial support upon arriving in the United States. Chapek felt he must stay with his congregation. Chapek's wife, Maja, was already in the States on a speaking tour, having departed shortly before the Nazis invaded. When they said their goodbyes as she left, they knew it might be the last time that they ever saw each other. And sadly, that was the case. Reverend Chapek continued to hold Sunday services and run his church's education, programming, and other events, sometimes with German soldiers present. He spoke out, first subtly, then more overtly, against the German occupation. He took part in the resistance. His biographer, Richard Henry, writes, one can only marvel at the moral stamina the spiritual toughness Norbert Chapek was able to summon under the circumstances. Heartsick at the absence of his beloved Maja, who was speaking before audiences thousands of miles away about his work, trying to rally support for the cause of their prostrate nation, he somehow managed to project an indomitable spirit amid the enveloping gloom. Reverend Chapek 
is an example of the type of courage you and I will most likely never be asked to call forth. We cling to our Unitarian Universalism as a spiritual refuge. It's a safe house in what can sometimes be a politically, culturally, or socially overly conservative environment. But we are not really that oppressed. Think of the Prague Congregation Unitaria. Think about, would I come to church with the Gestapo standing at the door and in the sanctuary taking names, knowing that you might be on the list? The oppression got worse in Czechoslovakia in October 1939 after a violent protest against the German occupation. And in June 1940, Čapek turned 70. The congregation gave him a gift of a shortwave radio, which came with the mandatory tag from German authorities that listening to and or relaying foreign radio broadcasts carried the penalty of death. Of course, Čapek listened and relayed the information anyway. He was first brought in for questioning in October 1940. He was released. He was not so lucky the second time. The Gestapo raided Reverend Chapek's apartment on the morning of March 28, 1941 and spent hours tearing the place apart, confiscating sermons and writings and letters and books and other belongings. Chapek served the officer in charge coffee, refusing to be intimidated or denigrated. Chapek and his youngest daughter Zora were arrested and charged with listening to foreign radio broadcasts. Chapek was sent to the concentration camp at Dachau on July 5, 1941, where he was issued prisoner number 30323. Later, he was sent to Hartheim Castle near Linz, Austria, where he was gassed. Of all the stories of all the famous Unitarian Universalists, Norbert Chapek is one of my favorites. If we had saints, he would be one. He certainly would be one of mine. He was a former Catholic who became a Baptist who became a Unitarian, seeking until he found that religion broad enough for his own spirit and his own ideas. And then he spent his lifetime making a religious home for others who needed one the way he did. And finally, when called to stand on the principle there is no such thing as a lesser person, he stood and spit in the Nazi's eye. He had the chance to escape, but he remained with his congregation, living under the type of situation you and I only know from history books and movies and family stories of horror and war. The story of Reverend Chapek is one of the reasons I am a Unitarian Universalist. And I wanted you to know his story today because the beautiful flower communion ritual that he invented comes to us from a beautiful person, a person of conviction and compassion, the type of person each and every one of us is called to be as a Unitarian Universalist. Reverend Chapek's theology is summed up well in his flower ceremony. We are all uniquely equal like the flowers. There never has been, there is not now, and never will be anyone exactly just like you. You are holy, a gift, singular, and so is your friend and your partner and your family member and that person you're not getting along with so well right now. That's how deep the symbolism of the flowers goes. Holy, a gift important, valuable. So is every person in the pride rainbow. So is every person of color. Every one of us a sacred treasure in our uniqueness and yet equal in what makes us fundamentally human together. A single flower is lovely, a bouquet even more beautiful and grand. Flowers can be extravagant in a garden or bouquet of a kind, a field of blue bonnets, a sanctuary of Easter lilies, a bouquet of roses. Perhaps more extraordinary is a garden or bouquet of all types of flowers, or something that's a favorite of mine, a meadow full of wildflowers. 
There is always a force in the world that seems like it does not want the mixing of the wildflowers or of the different types of flowers in the arrangement that insists on uniformity and on treating anyone who is an outsider or other differently. It seems there's always something at work that wants a scapegoat or an enemy to rally around in order to separate each type of flower only to its kind and then say which kind are valuable and which are not. And sometimes it's hard to see what that force is because it's easy as human beings to fall prey to it ourselves every now and then. You know, people still, and especially lately in recent years, ask how could Hitler have come to power? How could so many people have gone along with such genocidal prejudice? But is it really that hard to fathom? We're walking a tightrope like this now in our own country. And this situation happens among children and adults every day in schoolyards and offices and groups and clubs and governments. Happens whenever an us is created against a them instead of remembering there is only we. It's what makes people like Norbert Chopek so admirable. His ability to live out what most of us only talk about as our values. You know, who among us hasn't been told at one time or another for one reason or another, you don't belong here. We don't want your flower in this bouquet. It doesn't fit. It doesn't look right. That feeling can make one wither and die. It can produce hurt and resentment that lasts a lifetime. And in the worst cases, as Reverend Chopek experienced, it can mean genocide and death. We are called to see the beauty in all the uniquely equal flowers and all the uniquely equal people in our lives and in the world. And this is what it means to be a loving people in a loving community. The flowers are indeed good teachers. Reverend Chopek's most widely read book was called The Sunny Shore. It was what we would call a self-help book. And he taught this theology in that book, that we are all important and valuable. He knew what Unitarian Universalism still holds out to us, that every person, like the flowers, with sun and water and care and love, can all blossom and bloom and flower. We can create a beautiful world. And the opposite is also true. Without love and care, and with some neglect and a little hate, all of us can wither. This message of the flowers is under siege. Our politics now becomes, if you disagree with me, you're not just wrong, you are evil. The only way out of this is to begin dialogue, even with those with whom it seems we cannot communicate well. We must try, for if we fail, the result is what happened to Dr. Chopek totalitarianism promising to make everything better by eliminating all the people and ideas those in power don't agree with. We are called to have courage. We are called to understand and speak that language of flowers. If we don't do it now, our task will become increasingly difficult to the point where we may be called to stand the way Reverend Chopek was called to stand. We can make a witness to the world now about creating the world we dream about, or if we put it off, we may not get the chance later, and the witness may cost us too much, as it did Dr. Chopek. Because we must engage in promoting the idea that we are all valuable, uniquely equal flowers, it's why we house people in sanctuary why we funded the grocery store gift cards for our undocumented neighbors, why we work to make sure there is food security with the Woodbury Food Bank, and why we created SWIM. It's why we you you the vote and do notes for votes. It's why we plant hate has no home here signs in our yards. It's why we show up at the State House in Hartford and in downtown Meriden and in Woodbury and in Southbury for Black Lives Matter. It's why we fly rainbow flags and host pride organizing conferences and get our designation as a welcoming congregation. 
we can create hope with the flowers. We can build community by following Dr. Chapek's example. If we fail in building the world we dream about, I don't want to think about what comes after that. When people forget the language of the flowers, there are dictators in death camps. But if we remember the language of the flowers, there is always hope we can continue to create a beautiful bouquet of community.